Hi, everybody. It's great to see, again, great to see everybody. Um, well, tonight I'm super pleased because uh, Alvaro has been willing to uh, give his talk to us. Uh, he, uh, I, I learned about him from watching uh, the Southwest Birding Festival um, via online, uh, by Zoom, uh, a number of months ago, which has uh, lots of activities and, and which we attended in person a number of years ago. But uh, it was when I heard Alvaro speak, I thought, oh, this is great. We, we should have him. So I'll give a little introduction. So Alvaro Jaramillo, owner of the birding tour company, Alvaro's Exp Adventures, which I think is a great name for a birding tour company. Uh, was born in Chile, but began birding in Toronto, where he lived as a youth and up, up until he was an adult. He was trained in ecology and evolution with particular interest in bird behavior. Research forays and backpacking trips introduced Alvaro to the riches of the neotropics, where he has traveled extensively. He is the author of The Birds of Chile, an authoritative yet portable field guide to Chile's birds. Alvaro writes the Identify Yourself column in Bird Watcher's Digest magazine, and he recently wrote part of the Sparrow chapter for the Handbook of Birds of the World and the new ABA field guide, Birds of California. Alvaro was recently granted the Eisenman Medal by the Linnaean Society of New York, awarded occasionally for excellence in ornithology and encouragement of the amateur. He organizes and leads international birding tours, as well as a full schedule of pelagic trips in Central California. Alvaro lives with his family in Half Moon Bay, California. Please give a warm welcome to Alvaro Jaramillo. Thank you, Jeannie. I'm gonna start sharing the screen and get right into it here. Um, Alrighty. Let's see. And we'll and mute I, everybody else. Okay, and, and I guess, um, and I guess uh, we're gonna do questions on the chat. That might be the best way yes. to do it. Sometimes, you know, I'm, I get, you know, going on things and uh, and I, I may not see somebody asking a question so maybe we'll leave them to the end but for if that's you know okay yes. um well so welcome thanks for inviting me i'm um i think uh this talk will be a little different from a lot of birding talks that you might have seen just because it's it's a perspective on on birding and health as well as how we bird how we actually contemplate birds and understand things um, while when we're seeing them. So now, you know, and, and, and hopefully it's also going to be a little little fun to listen to all this. So, you know, that's that's it's really about birding. It's, an, it's about how people relate to birds and nature and how we as birders are really kind of a special group in a sense of, of people that are out there um, understanding these these flying creatures in a way that you know paying attention to them in the way that most people don't um i want to start though with this situation it's like you know one of the things that you you um experience when you're birding is nature just general spots that are great whether it's a lakeshore or forest or you know weedy field you you're immersed in this natural environment and that's really important uh, for various reasons. One, we see birds there, but also there's been this, these studies on how people react to natural environments. And in particular in Stanford University, there's been a study that takes students, you know, and has some of them um, essentially um, looked at for all of their stress hormones and, you know, their blood, uh, you know, hormone levels of any kind of uh, issue related to stress, you take those people, send half of them to the city, send half of them into a natural place. Like this is the Santa Cruz Mountains, not too far away from where I live, but not too far away from Stanford either. And, you know, bring them back and see how that chemistry has changed. And then in, in, as you would guess, those that were out in the natural world come back with less of any of the chemistry, body chemistry that is related to depression, broodiness, rumination, anything that makes you sort of, you know, that, that, that feeling of stress. So getting out in nature is good for you. It's healthy and it helps you out. And of course, for us, birds get us out to, to um, um, nature. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there, a little 
red thing came up. Um, hmm. I'm not sure if I did that or uh, can I just clear that? Oh, there, I cleared it. <laughs> I don't know that I did that, but anyway. So one of the things that this study also has found out that the key situation that good people are looking at is fractals. Fractals are like this, you know, tree, this fake tree where, you know, you go to each branch and each branch is like another little tree or a, a lake shore. The more you look at it in detail, you get closer and closer to the lake shore and it's like another little lake shore and another little lake shore and it sort of opens up into more and more levels depending on how closely you look at it. Fractals seem to be important in how we, you know, um, our brains kind of get get into these things and start thinking about other things that aren't stress. But this computer generated fractal does not do any of it for you. You have to go and see the real thing out there in nature. So you have to go see a real tree. You have to go see a real lake. You have to go see these things to get the benefits of the natural world. So, you know, it. I always tell people that in a sense, you know, because birds get us out there, birds are the gateway drug to nature. They're the ones that take you out and, and, and you get all of these benefits, not just from seeing the birds and meeting your friends and having a good time, but you're out in these green spaces. And we don't necessarily always understand that how amazing that is and how healthy that is for us as people to be out there. A lot of people don't have anything that takes them out into nature in a regular way, like we do as birds, birders. And then you get to see these amazing things. This is a, one of my backyard Townsend's warblers. They actually uh, winter here, beautiful bird, you know, and you, you get to see these things that are just fantastic. Or offshore, we might see a Pomeranian Jaeger out there, you know, in, in fall migration, you might see a Pomeranian Jaeger go by in, in, in Lake Ontario or short-eared owls in winter. They, they're just such amazing creatures and with all sorts of diversity, some that come in in the winter, some that come in in the breeding season. And it, we're always kind of like, it's it, the panorama of birds is changing for us. I think also birding is one of the most, perhaps the most portable hobby on earth. You can go to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, the most isolated island where you can land in a plane on earth and there's birds there. You can go to Antarctica, middle of nowhere and there's birds there and some of these birds are really special ones so not only do we get to do our thing in these places but they're actually really great places to go watch birds and that is not the case for most activities you know you can imagine you could be interested in golf or chess or you know all sorts of other activities it's you know you can't do them everywhere on earth like you can with uh with birding and I always say too, that it's like a good hot sauce. It goes well with all sorts of other things. So you don't have to exclusively be birding. You can go fishing and be birding. You can even play golf or be birding. You can add a great meal to the end of the day after you've been birding. And it, it correlates well, or like myself, I walk the dogs and I'm birding. Or, um, you know, you, you can sometimes even just, you know, be watching as we were talking earlier, watching out your office window or something and, and see a good bird. And, uh, and that's, that's amazing. You know, how many things in life are that versatile? And for me too, I've over the years realized I've seen so many amazing things through birding, whether it's volcanic eruptions, shark attacks, or even this, this, this bird down here, this storm petrel is called the Pinkoya storm petrel. And I helped to actually name it. It's a new discovery as of, you know, 10 years ago. And to think that that all happened through birding. I wasn't doing a scientific, ex, you know, expedition or anything. I was watching birds taking pictures and then little by little, this whole thing happened in front of my eyes that we realized we were seeing something brand new. Um, the other thing too, is that you, you have uh, as a human, this love of living things, you know, and, and I always tell people, have you ever wondered why we need pets, you know, or most people have pets, not all people, or you have a house plant, you know, it, you're taking care of this plant inside your house. It almost makes no sense, but it's because we need those things around us. We have a love of life, of living things. 
And that is just, um, you know, E.O. Wilson uh, coined the term biophilia. And he says this is all over the world. All humans want to be near other living things. So we, as birders, get to partake in that and, and fulfill that need in a way that many other people don't. Um, so December 31st, for most people, that's the change of the calendar year. And for average people, there are certain dates that will mark certain things in their life or in the things they think about. But for anybody interested in nature and particularly birders, every single day is a different day with different possibilities. And you know roughly when the warblers arrive, you know, in, in late April, early May, or that some other birds might start breeding in June, you start thinking of what's gonna happen now in October with fall migration, and maybe it's eagle time, you know, that's going to happen right now. All of these dates become important in a way that for most people, they're not. But we're paying attention to these cycles of things going north, south, moving around, breeding. And that is special, paying attention to the day, like a day matters and a, and a different week of the month matters is unique. Um, most people don't actually see the world this way, but as birders, we do. And you can enjoy this in just the backyard. You can watch, these are some of my backyard birds and probably some of your backyard birds, house finches, American goldfinch, and you know, enjoy these birds. And then you can also go in tents on birds. You can be, uh, you know, chase and look for vagrants and rarities and list keeping and all of that. And the broad spectrum of what's available in birding is also actually to me rather unique. Um, and uh, I'll get to this at the end too, how in other, other um, pastimes, sometimes you cannot kind of partake in the, all of the, the, the breadth of what's involved. So th this is a rare rustic bunting a few years ago that a friend of mine found in Golden Gate Park. Uh, th those are British birders actually uh, looking at something. So that's not the Golden Gate Park people, but you can you know be interested in this sort of uh, real high energy, intense type of birding as and to me, you know, the first step to, to birding and understanding these birds is getting their name. You know, the, that is identification. Identification really is the starting point of putting a name onto it so that we can then layer other levels of, of information. Like Lawrence's goldfinch is not found in New York state. So, you know, if you identify this as a Lawrence's goldfinch due to the yellow on the breast, you already start knowing things about it. Uh, or you might know that it's a dry country bird, or you start putting in other aspects of, of understanding. So the step one for, you know, I, I say to people, you really don't have to know the name of a bird. You could go in the backyard and look at the red bird and the yellow bird and the brown bird and, and never really know the names. But the moment you do, the moment you identify them, you actually have some structure to work with so to further understand what you're seeing. And here's a pink-headed warbler from Guatemala. They're also found in Chiapas in Southern Mexico and just a beautiful, beautiful bird, you know, just a um, fantastic creature that I always tell people that the head more than pink looks like a really good watermelon that's been opened up, you know, and you have that frosty bit, you know, so I would have called it watermelon-headed warbler and maybe some people have been happy with that. And in identification, you have situations that are tougher, right? More difficult. So this for some people is fun to go and, and look through these uh, brown immature goals to other people, it's a nightmare. And that's a good thing to know, like what you enjoy in birding and what you don't. You know, you don't have to actually take part in everything that's out there in birding. You can just pick and choose what you wanna do. Um, for me, this is super fun. I love goals. I love uh, looking through in the different levels of, of trying to understand that this is actually a, a young herring goal. Um, some people love the New York Times crossword puzzle. To me, this is a nightmare. I cannot function, make doing crosswords. My brain doesn't work that way. You know, if I had to, you know, do a crossword to get out of you know, some, some precarious situation, you know, I've been put in jail and they say, oh, you know, finish this crossword and you can get out. I, I probably would stay in jail because I, could, I couldn't do it. And you see, you have to just know who you are and what it really kind of grabs you and what is maybe a nightmare for you. So 
it's it's amazing too that as humans we uh, we have these different um, interests and also abilities. And with birds, it's broad enough that we don't have to all do it and bird in the same way. I want to keep that keep that um, um, straight. I think. And this talk, you know, part of it, the middle part here, I'm going to talk about this entire uh, idea of brain function and birding. And it comes directly from a book that summarizes pretty well called Thinking Fast and Slow. And that's one of the reasons it's called Birding Fast and Slow by um, Daniel Kahneman. And it's a, a book written by an economist to understand how, how the brain makes decisions in, in economic sense um, and in our behavior in general, uh, but it applies so well to birding. And <clears throat> I wanted to start with just this thing, because this really sort of, uh, to me, simplifies a lot of what I'm talking about is, I'm gonna give you a test, a real quick identification test. And maybe in the chat, if you identify this bird, you can put it in the chat, whatever it is, uh, don't be shy. There's, you know, there's no, you know, actually there is a right answer. There's like actually a couple of right answers, but it, I don't want to stress you out. I just want to give you a very, um, a test of birding here. See, did you see it? <laughs> did anybody see it? It was quick. Um, I know, oh, here's somebody. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat. Pigeon, pigeon, rock pigeon, rock dove. You see how there's multiple answers? They're all right, by pigeon, rock dove, or rock pigeon. They, I, I'll take any of them. Now you want to contemplate what just happened. So if you think about the fact that multiple people identified that bird, but they had a less than a second view, how can it be that anybody identified it? How could you have seen any field marks? I I would argue you didn't see any field marks. You just knew what it was without even thinking. You saw the image, you know, of, of a, a pigeon and, and you identified it as such. And even if I show you a pigeon for a while, even knowing what the ID marks of a pigeon are is, is you know, we probably have never even thought about it. Oh yeah, there's got these black bars on the wing, reddish legs, the shape, the gray. Um, but you really, if you, you know, if you, even if you thought about pigeon and didn't write it down, you had recognized this as a pigeon and that your brain was doing that, not in the way that we tend to think we identify birds. And I call this one, the big lion birding, because if you go on any outing and uh, an experienced birder shows you something, in this case, I have a black throated gray warbler, but over, you know, um, where you are might be a palm warbler this time of year, you know, and, and let's say a palm warbler is uh, flits through very quickly and that that person says, oh, that was a palm warbler there and just went shooting off. And then you say, well, how? How'd you know that that was a palm warbler? And they will start reciting all the marks. Oh, the palm warblers wag their tail. They have yellow underneath. They're kind of brownish. And none of those things that person saw they just knew it was a palm work. They just knew. And that's, to me, is key, because how are we trying to teach people to identify these things when, in fact, the really experienced people just know things without actually going through all the field marks? So there's a little later, I'll let you know how, how it kind of works. But what's happening is that there's two modes of thinking in your brain. There's this system one and system two. System one, is the fast system. System two is the slow system, the birding fast and slow. So system one is unconscious, automatic, and you do everyday kind of decisions with it. It also is error prone. The system two is conscious, effortful, it's contemplative, complex decisions that are being done. And your brain is doing both of these things at the same time often, or in this case of this Cooper's hawk, you if you're really experienced with Cooper socks, you may just know that that's a Cooper sock. Other people might start looking through and say, okay, it's got a rounded tail, lots of white at the tip of the tail, um, real straight um, forewing, big head. 
you know, and you can go through a system two way of identifying this or a system one if you're experienced and say, gosh, you know, that looks just like a Cooper's hawk. And um, both can happen. And I'll say that, you know, if you're, if you're kind of relatively newer in the birding scene and you get to meet a lot of experienced birders, you will, something that, that sometimes is almost like a conundrum. Why is it that like, for example, here where I live, you know, we have Anna's hummingbirds, beautiful birds, or, you know, bright breeding warblers, American goldfinches, these amazing looking creatures. But experienced birders always like the ugly brown things, right? They like to look at gulls, they like to look at flycatchers, sparrows, you know, all the stuff that's really kind of difficult. And it's because they have put so many of the birds into their recognition bucket that sort of the, the fast system that slowing down and actually going through and met, doing being more methodical about identification is it's it's more fun it's more fun for that experienced birder and it's a nightmare for the new birder because this might be too much trying to sort out these immature goals or some of the sparrows it takes a little bit more experience so this kind of explains why experienced people often gravitate to these kind of brownish dull looking things that you would think huh why are they so into the, you know swifts you know seabirds and system two is you know it does take effort and it can be tiring so when you're in the west learning hawks for example and you're you know whoops oh oh I'm not sure what happened there something weird happened there we go um so if you are learning hawks and you're seeing a red tail hawk, okay, it's got a red tail, then you could see another hawk with a red tail, but somebody says, well, that's not a red tail hawk, that's a ferruginous hawk. And you have to sort of go, okay, well, the red tail hawk is as dark here, the ferruginous doesn't, ferruginous has longer, kind of more pointy wings. Oh yeah, lots of pale on the under part of the ferruginous, all sorts of things that you, know, you, you have to go through effort to sort that out. And as you repeat, you repeat, you see things more often and it could be a red shouldered versus a broad wing. You re repeat, repeat, repeat. And a lot of this gets shifted to the fast system, system one. And you're no longer identifying things using your system two. So, you know, I can show you this and a lot of people go, oh yeah, Kestrel, right? And if you've gotten to that point, you've you put it into that fast system, unconscious, automatic. You just recognize a kestrel. You actually aren't looking at the field marks anymore of a kestrel. But you, we, we all begin in system two. We all start out that way and we shift some birds through experience to the fast system over time. And more examples of how this all works and the fact that you have an intuitive way of thinking and an analytical way of thinking is this example that um, Kahneman gives, and it's kind of a classic one, where you're supposed to add the cost of a bat and a baseball together, and it's a dollar ten. The bat costs dollar more than the ball. Most people will say, "Ah, the ball must cost ten cents." But if if the if the bat costs a dollar more, it would cost a dollar ten cents. Plus the ten cents would be a dollar twenty, right? So that's not the answer. the The answer is uh, five cents. So then, you know, a dollar five plus five cents is a dollar ten. So, but most of us get it wrong. Let's put it. But it's not really wrong. It's it's wrong mathematically. But it's how our brain tends to work. We jump to a intuitive conclusion on most things. And with identification, we jump to an intuitive conclusion as well. Um, most people, uh, that's how they bird. Um, the, the issue is that trying to do everything through system two, the slow system, the analysis is tiring. Your brain does not like to do all of this all the time. And it, whatever it can, it'll move it to system one to take over. So classic example of this is learning to drive. If you remember learning to drive, how many millions of things you had to be thinking about, looking up there, you know, the lights, your speed, 
your, your gas gauge, all of these things, it was really stressful. And now you probably drive as if you're sleeping. <laughs> Hopefully you're not sleeping, but you know what I mean? You, it's automatic. You have shifted all of that com com complexity to system to the, the fast system rather than you know, doing the analysis. It's very powerful. This is how humans have been able to do all of the things we do is by using these two systems and sometimes just shoving things over to the easy way of doing, doing stuff once our brain learns how to do it. Um, and this, is a, to me, this came up last summer during the Olympics. We had the idea of the twisties, you know, where you could have these high level um, gymnastics athletes almost lose their automatic unconscious way of doing their craft and that this was really dangerous because the moment you start thinking about doing this is when you will fail it's almost the same as when you you know you're tired and you're trying to drive and you start thinking about what you're doing and you're paying attention to looking there to, and you're not driving well anymore because you're tired it's the same kind of thing you 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 are now shifting it to the wrong system and it's not good in this in this case it's error prone i put it you know right down here also system one is error prone and i wanted to show you this picture if, i don't know if you've ever seen a white tail kite but here's a white tail kite i took a picture of this white tail kite because i saw it oh it's a white tail kite i looked at it took a picture and then later i realized that's not a white tail kite that's a bag that's a plastic bag sitting in the tree and it has the dark shoulder it it re it has all sorts of things but my system, my fast system automatically identified that as a white tail kite. Then later my analysis was like, oh, that isn't a white tail kite. And this happens all the time. If you've ever heard of the leaf bird, the rock bird, the what have you, you might've seen them too. So, um, I mean, this to me looks like a sleeping black oyster catcher and it's just a, a bit of a rock. Uh, I thought this was a thrush up here um, sitting on, on a branch, it's a leaf. It's just a dead leaf. And then this, I, I got this one down to cinnamon teal and it's just a bottle, you know, on the water. <laughs> and these are, this is all your, your, you know, system one, your fast system, identifying these things immediately, but getting them wrong. And it happens all the time too. We also have this issue of uh, confirmation bias where we, we like the facts that confirm what we already think is true, <laughs> right? So we, we take those as the ones that we go, yeah, yep, yeah, that, that's, that's it. And the classic example in my experience was when I was in Ontario, so just on the other side of the lake from you, and there was a reported very thrush, which as you know, is really rare out that far east. So very thrush was coming into a feeder at, um, in the winter and and the the notes were that oh it comes in through the real dark shrub in the bottom and it doesn't really come quite right out and and so forth and i remember some birders there seeing looking in the shrub and seeing this bird come out and it had you know reddish breast with a dark line through the breast which is a uh, field mine for very thrush and they said there it is there it is you know and they identified it and you know high fives they leave that bird comes out again and came out a little further and I realized it was a shadow it was a branch actually in the, on a robin and it had it was not the very thrush the very thrush came out a little later but it was not the very thrush they had seen but that confirmation bias they wanted to see a very thrush they were ready to see one they saw a red-breasted bird with a dark band everything fit and it was coming out underneath the bush as everybody said it usually did and they saw the very thrush, but they didn't. Um, and so our brain does all sorts of interesting things. So, you know, our field guides teach us to first to identify, right? We don't, we can't get to that recognition stage immediately, but what we do, the, this is a plate from, of geese from, from Chile. You know, we start looking through and seeing these birds and putting a name to them. So, okay, so there's the Andean goose here that's white, there's a kelp goose that's really white, the upland goose that's, you know, breast is white. And you start looking for difference. Okay, this one's got dark bill, this one's got yellow legs, this one's got orange legs. And, and you start putting it together through <clears throat> field marks, habitat, 
and eventually just knowing the name and the image in your head of what an Andean goose looks like and where it's found, you will start recognizing that after you repeat, repeat, repeat. But you start with field, field marks and the name. You wanna like look at the, the field marks, what identifies this thing and understand, okay, that's American Robin, red breast, dark back and so forth. And you're, okay, Robin, Robin, Robin. And that starts getting it in, in your brain. So a coot, you know, American coot with its, uh, it's not quite a duck. There's some differences in the, in the, in the shape real gray, no striping, nothing, you know, you see this kind of thing. And you, our brain actually has very specific software, I would call it, that identifies faces, human faces. And I think that's what happens. That's what you're using to identify and eventually recognize an American coot. So we see it like a face. We see it like uh, in a full image where we don't know you know, you can, you can recognize friends without knowing all of the different aspects. If somebody asked you, you know, the field marks of your friend, you wouldn't know, you just recognize them, right? And that is how we actually recognize birds too. And I have another talk about that, but it's, that's the shortcut to it. And then we have, our brain gets loaded with these really almost auto, uh, you know, neurons were a very specific neuron in the, in the brain captures the, the, the concept of a harlequin duck, what it looks like, the name, all sorts of aspects of that harlequin duck is captured in there. So you see this and your mind says, huh, harlequin duck. And um, I, I think that's roughly how it happens. And it happens through repetition and experience in the field. And I wanna tell you that one of the things that I found quite amazing some a few years ago was the first Canada warbler I hadn't, I mean, I hadn't seen a Canada warbler for years, 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 years. And I think I was in Columbia in the wintering grounds and this Canada warbler came up and I used to see them every year when I lived in Ontario. And the feeling that I had when I saw the Canada warbler wasn't that the, just the feeling of like, oh, great, you know, haven't seen one for years or another one for the list or, you know, um, that kind of feeling. It was the same feeling as if you'd seen a friend that you hadn't seen since college times. And you said, oh my gosh, Gerald, I haven't seen you forever. And you recognize Gerald and you get that weird, that feeling of this time you spent together, all this really kind of emotional uh, connection. And I think it makes sense in so many ways because if we're actually using the face recognition system we have to recognize birds, that is also associated with an emotional content of, of how we see birds. And they're living things, they're living things. They're not, you know, um, they're not cans of Coke where each comes in a different color where we have no, no real connection to that these birds do actually make us feel things. Um, in terms of brain power, you know, I also want to say that it can be really difficult when you're beginning to bird to understand and see all of these things and put it all together and you can tire yourself out. And anytime birding is becoming like almost too much, you've got to sort of slow it down a bit, go back, because the moment you are either just really exhausted mentally or not enjoying it or just feeling like you're not good at this, you're not going to learn. You have to be in a positive frame of mind. And sometimes you just gotta snap back to the easier birds to identify, you know, a, a male American red start. And, you know, maybe you don't wanna be tackling all of those flycatchers right away because it just can, can overload you. So keep that in mind. And also when you have difficult um, situations like, flycatchers or like um, shorebirds, you have to concentrate on these difficult tasks. And I wanna let you know that there's, uh, if you go and just Google, you know, there's the basketball and the gorilla and you will, I mean, I gave away the uh, punchline there, but there's this situation where, and you can say, send this to others and not tell them how it works, but, it's a game where you're trying to count how many times these uh, people pass a basketball around and you're, it's difficult to count the passes. So you're counting the passes. And while all of this happening, somebody in a gorilla suit walks through the back 
And most people don't notice the gorilla suit person because you're paying attention to all of this complex stuff of counting. The reverse is also true. When you become more adept at birding and you're identifying things automatically by recognition, your brain kind of gets uh, a little bit more open and has more time and energy to devote to other things, to actually just enjoying the, you know, the trees, the, the, the plants, you're almost not, you're paying attention, but you're doing it automatically. So I would say there's a, there's a, a real beauty to um, a benefit to recognizing birds eventually that opens you up to more enjoyment of being in the natural world. Um, so this is, yeah, this is what I, I kind of talking about. It's difficult to do two things at the same time, but if you just get to the level where there is some cognitive strain, right? Something's a little difficult, but doable. You learn better than, you know, you pay more attention than if you're just doing the easy stuff. So there's, there's a real fine line from getting overloaded to like, you just want to low overload, not, um, not overload, but just get yourself to a difficult situation so that you can say, aha, uh -huh, I can see this difference or I'm paying attention here and that. It's um, if you make a written statement in a difficult font to read, you actually pay more attention to what you're reading because it's more difficult to read that font. So that's the font problem. And I think that works well in birds too to sort of get yourself to the point where you just have a little cognitive strain but you're not overloaded and then you will learn and be enjoying this otherwise it just becomes difficult um memory is amazing a um, memory we have actually very um um almost uh emotional memory to smell and i wanted to say this is a woodcock this is actually a eurasian woodcock not an American woodcock, but I, I don't have an American woodcock photo. And I took this one in Japan. And I always remember um, woodcocks when they came in in March or so, that there was a, if you were in, in that situation, the snow had melted, those de you know dead kind of rotting leaves were there, the mud was thick, and there was this smell, there was a smell that I still associate, if I ever smell that smell, I know it's woodcock time. And pay attention to these things because sometimes they will work as a birder, you know, if you're paying attention to not just what you're seeing, but what you're smelling or what you're feeling in like that north brisk northwest wind in the fall with puffy clouds. And that to me was eagle weather eagle weather, you know, and if you just watched in the North Shore of Lake Ontario for eagles in October and had that situation or just that brisk wind um, and it's cool, then it was eagle weather. And I don't know exactly what all the aspects of what was going on, but in my mind, I've just associated that because I was just sort of paying attention to what was going on around me. And that is actually a good thing to do as a birder, not just pay attention to the birds, but everything else that's going on around you. Um, so we learn by repetition, uh, predictability. We kind of um, have a model of the world of what a ring neck duck looks like. And then we see one again and again and again, and it reinforces that model of what that bird looks like. And the name ring neck duck, even though it's not a good name, it's just what will get stuck there. And then you become more in tune and start recognizing these things. Um, Kahneman also proposes that there's this, you know, it's, we call, he calls it what you see is all there is. And we, we experience things and we don't experience them in a rational way way we experience them in an intuitive way really because so many things are fast system um, and you know that we're we're sort of processing as a fast system we shortcut we have preconceptions we then as birders everything you read about birding and identification we we read as if we're supposed to do this in a rational manner in a in an analytical type to uh, type, you know, identification, but we actually don't do that. We tend to like knee jerk 
and identify things once you get more experience. So I would say knee jerk birding is in your future. If you run it, you know, if you start kind of getting open to this kind of um, way of seeing things. We also, um, we also are not always prepared to see the abnormal. We, we, you know, make everything fit what we expect to be there, kind of like that very thrush example. Um, a lot of rare birds are often found in a small patch of, of woods or a shorebird in a, in a very, in the, right close to the road in some place where there's shorebird habitat, because those are the, those are the ones people look at more carefully. Um, and therefore it's easier to sort of see difference. And uh, if somebody is sort of prepared for the abnormal and for you're open to it, you might see something different. So this you might see go over and you think, oh gosh, there's a bald eagle, young bald eagle flying over. It's got the pale under the, uh, the wings and so forth. But actually this is not a bald eagle. This is a young white tailed eagle from Europe, Asia. And you refer you know, you see something like this, you're going to think it's a bald eagle if you're in North America, but you know, sometimes you also have to be open to all of the possibilities and start, if something looks really weird to you, and if one of you is sort of a real hawk person, say, gosh, that tail looks weird, kind of pointy, that's one of the keys that you, that um, why it's not a bald eagle. So birding fast and slow, system one is in a sense, why we often get things wrong, why we, a rock becomes a bird, and, but it's also why we get so many things right. In fact, most of the time, system one, the fast birding is correct. And our, you know, it's almost the gut feel of what, what that bird is. And now these goldfinches, I have multiple different species of goldfinches in my yard. Um, sometimes you, it's a lot that's going on and you can't just, you know, you've got to get to, say, gosh, you know, I got to slow down here and figure out what this one is because it doesn't quite look right. And that's when you know that you've got to, that your system one is not actually doing the trick and you've got to sort of slow down and ask for essential reinforcement from system, system two. Um, this is, I think, a cool story because it, it, a lot of stuff is going on, but also our brain, uh, you know, you have to be open, open-minded to what's going on and also open-minded to critical thinking as to what you're seeing. And um, this is something that happened when I was on my first trip to Alaska as a grad student with my professor, Jim Rising, who was a really well-known sparrow and oriole researcher. He wrote a book, the book, um, Field Guide to the Sparrows of North America. and we were out in the Denali Highway and out in the middle of nowhere in sort of a tundra area. And one of the birds I really wanted to see was gray crown rosy finch. Now this is not the actual bird. These are photos I just picked up online. But um, I now know that where I was, there are no gray crown rosy finches. They don't exist in that spot of Alaska. But somehow I had it in my mind. I wanted to see this thing. And I'm looking through with the binoculars and I say, oh, gosh, Jim, I think I see a great crown rosy finch, brown bird, pale nape and so forth. And he, we get the scope on it. We had the scope on it and he looks at it. And, you know, this is a well-known ornithologist. He told me at, later, don't tell this story to anyone, but now I can. <laughs> and um, it wasn't a rosy finch because it flew off. And when it flew off, we realized it was a golden eagle. So somehow in our brains we had filled in all of this information and thought okay you know the bird was much further away than we thought in the tundra we saw the pale nape which a golden eagle has we saw the brown body which a golden eagle has but somehow something there we just worked ourselves up into into this our brain filling in all that we couldn't see and it was only when it flew that it was impossible not to see the fact that we totally screwed up a golden eagle and that just shows you that, you know, your brain is not completely objective when it sees things and you have to also be checking it as, as you go along. So, you know, um, how do you really get better at this birding? And I, I've said it before, repetition. You look and look and look at more peregrine falcons or dunlins or golden eagles or great crown rosy finches over and over and over again, different angles in, 
in the field and also images. Images online can help a lot and they actually function to load up your brain with the right information to recognize birds. So you don't always have to see the live bird, but it's better if you see the live bird, you see the habitat, you hear it, you do all of these things that put it together in context. Also, you have to spend a lot of time if you really want to be expert at birds. Now, you don't have to get to 10,000 hours, but every hour you put in is more that you're learning, right? And I always tell people, get creative and making birding part of your daily life. So like I walk the dog and I go birding, could be like walk to the supermarket instead of drive, take binoculars with you most places you go and just incorporate the fact that even five minutes looking out the backyard is teaching you something. Every house finch you see is teaching you something. So you need an environment that is regular and predictable. And then you can sort of learn through practice this house finch, see a female house finch over and over and over and again. And you will learn not only what a house finch looks like, but what birds aren't house finches when you see them. So don't ignore common birds. They're the ones that you're gonna see most times, most days, and teach you the most about how to recognize other birds, believe it or not. How sparrow has a very specific shape, a big head, a big bill, sturdy legs. Those are things you might have never thought about, but seeing this over and over and over again, when you see other kinds of sparrows, you know, sort of new world sparrows with their smaller heads, little skinnier legs and so forth, they look different. And I would say restrict yourself to a patch, having a place where you can go back to over and over and over again, that's near where you live, that's a good birding spot where you can go in winter and summer and spring. And then you learn how things move through there, how they, you know, mold happens, the young birds, you start seeing all of this in a restricted place. That teaches you a lot. Patch birding teaches you a lot. So when you learn what a song sparrow looks like and a house sparrow, if you see something like a lingon sparrow, it's going to pop out at you after a while because it's like you say, hmm, that's not a song sparrow. I know song sparrow. You may not automatically know it's a lingon sparrow, but you're three quarters of the way there by watching a lot of song sparrows. Um, and once you gain experience, teach others, bring more people into this amazing world of birding because that's actually one of the most joyful um, aspects of actually you know, being able to lead a trip or you know, write something about them or just show somebody in your neighborhood a bird. It's so fantastic. And that's also healthy for you. Once you have some experience, bring more people into the fold. I'll also say that one of the things that is, I find really weird in birding is that we are so, so, worried about getting something wrong, identifying something wrong in public and thinking that, you know, your name's going to be mud. Nobody's going to believe anything you're ever going to see again. But when you get something wrong is when you learn. And in fact, that, that trauma of getting something wrong in public helps you learn that much more readily than if you had just sort of thought about it and not said anything and said, oh, is that a Lincoln? That's a Lincoln spare, isn't it? And somebody said, no, it's a song spare, actually. That moment of going, ah, I can't believe I misidentified that actually taught you something. And uh, getting things wrong should be encouraged if we are wanting to have people learning about birds. So there's nothing wrong with getting something wrong in public. So let's, let's be open to it. I'm gonna end up with a few things that I just wanted to tell you about. Um, and one of them that I find really striking is that all of these companies, so I picked Starbucks. It has various logos over the years. Millions of dollars have been spent trying to get these logos to make you feel something, have an emotional connection with that cup of coffee, that whatever. They spend millions of dollars to have emotional connection with you. And then we go birding, we actually have emotional co connections to these birds and we see them not just as, like I said, it's not a cup of coffee with a different label on it. This is a Wilson's warbler. We know things about the Wilson's warbler, how it acts, what it does and so forth. But look at the face. If you look at the Wilson's warbler's face, to me, 
it looks kind of happy. It looks jovial. There's something that's just friendly looking about a Wilson's warbler, little hat. And then you think, why don't we describe birds that way in the field, field guide? If we did with that emotional content of what you see, the expression of the bird, it'd be so much easier to identify it rather than you know, telling you to look at the, at the tail spots or, or something else. I think we're missing out. And, and Starbucks and all these other people know about it. It's emotional content. So here's one of my backyard chestnut back chickadees, cutest thing in the world, little tiny bill, big head. So I would say this is the cute looking chickadee and this is the mean looking chickadee, mountain chickadee, because it has a stripe through the eye. Look how different those two birds look just in their face. And obviously it's no meaner than a chestnut back chickadee. It's just what I'm, you know, the emotional kind of feel I'm getting from these birds to describe them. And um, it really works, you know, and all of these difficult shorebirds, for example, we're always trying to find, um, you know, in most places in North America, we're trying to find the rough, this one. And, you know, we start comparing it to buck breasts and to yellow legs and this and that, you know, how to identify them. But if you look right at the face, right in there, and look behind the eye, if I tell you that the rough is Cleopatra, you will, next time you see a rough with a little dark stripe to the eye, you will know you're seeing a rough. And we don't have to look at anything else. It's all in the face of that bird. So I feel like we're missing out by not having some of this expression and you know, other, other aspects from, from birding. Also, I encourage people to take notes and make drawings. And then you can, in fact, take, make your drawing in the field, never look at it again, recycle it. And the fact that you've been drawing that and paying attention to it and doing the hand-eye coordination makes you remember what you were seeing. Um, also can consider that we don't have to bird all in the same way. Some people are truly fit to be type A competitive listers. Some people are more fit to be looking in the backyard for behavior, colorful things, and, and details of how they interact with each other. There's no, nothing wrong about one type of birding or another type of birding. Just find the kind of birding that, that you find fun. I would say it's also life is too short to bird with unpleasant people. <laughs> find your group, the people you find pleasant and that actually support you in your birding so that you can learn more. There can be some people who are just a different kind of birder that just don't, they don't fit well with you. And it doesn't matter how much they know or don't know, that's not a good fit. So uh, find the people who are going to be supportive of your birding, just have a good time. Those 10 years, 10,000 hours will go by in no time. And I'll also say that list, uh, a li big list does not make you happy necessarily. And seeing new things, novelty, something you've never seen before, that's cool. Seeing a different plumage, seeing something unique, a rare bird, all of that makes you happy. But just the, the number of birds on the list does not make you happy. And in fact, when you start, I, I encountered this where I would go try to look for a bird that had been reported and I didn't see it. And I'd come back home driving, feeling like I'd failed at birding. And I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. I don't want to feel like I failed at birding. So just keep in mind that you don't have to bird like everybody else does. And birds are not a commodity. You cannot tell me that, you know, a whole group of little tiny flycatchers from South America that all look the same are exactly the same as a stellar seagull. Stellar seagull is fantastic. You will never forget a stellar seagull. You might forget a paltry tyrannulid. Um, you might, and that's, that's fine. Birds are not all the same. And keep that in mind when you're looking for some of these things, there's some birds that are just life-changing really when you see them. So um, it's all about happiness. Uh, for me, these goals, they're like Zen. They're, they make me happy. They make me calm. To me, they meditate. It's a meditation to look at these goals, but it's a nightmare to others. So that's fine. Find what you like and also think that there's every moment in birding you can choose to sort of make it positive or negative. I, you know, maybe that failure of coming back home from not seeing the bird, I should have seen that as a 
positive way or something. I didn't, but you know, we we want to be intentional in our in our birding, not just let it sort of sweep us uh, in a way that maybe it's not the right way we want to be going. We want to have a good time because this is the most amazing thing you can be doing with your time. Watching nature is fantastic. And then, you know, like I keep telling people like, you know, this will make you better at birding, identify this, identify that. Do you have to be a great birder? No, the, the great birders are the ones who are having a good time. That's all you need to do. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to give you some pointers as to how you can sort of broaden your horizons and learning and birding and how your brain works and so forth. That's why I put this talk together. But I wanted to mention that I've been to Mavericks this big wave surfing competition that happens every so often here where I live in Half Moon Bay, where these massive waves, 40 feet high, crazy, you know, people have, you know, th this is the insane level of surfing that happens at Mavericks. And what's interesting to me is to watch, I was there with my scope and watching all the other people there, most of them were surfers. Perhaps all of them except myself were surfers. They, they knew what was going on, they understood the whole deal but none of them are ever going to be riding Mavericks. Yet, they all considered themselves part of the same thing. They were all surfers or people who are interested in surfing. And I think that's really a good lesson for birders. We don't, why do we separate the international birder versus the backyard birder versus the identification fanatic versus the, the, you know, the, the, the person's interested in behavior? We're all birders. And you know, I think the moment we sort of come together and sort of uh, try to get more people involved in this is the moment that we really sort of need to be at today when we need more people out there paying attention to birds because that's how conservation happens. So everybody who likes birds is a birder. And I wanna end uh, by saying that I started as a kid as, as a birder and I eventually said, I'm gonna do this as my job. And a lot of well-meaning adults said to me, but eh, you know, like, how are you gonna make any money? How are you gonna survive? You can't just be a bird person. You can't do this, you can't do that. And gosh, they're all really well-meaning and it's true. It was really tough to get to the situation where I can, you know, be a professional birder. But um, they all said, you know, like the real world, the, the, and when you get to the real world and things start happening, you, you know, you've got to, let go of all your heart, you know, you've got to put the structures in place for, you know, all the talk. But here is where I think, you know, looking at San Francisco and I'm looking at these hawks in front going migrating through. And I wonder what is the real world? I think the hawks are actually the real world. This is the real world. And I, I feel like if you're a birder, you partaking in this way of really connecting to the real world and count yourself as lucky. And I think one day, you know, when you're all stressed out, people are gonna be stressed out and going to the doctor for something, the medicine somebody might say is go birding, go to nature, because it's what's gonna be the healthiest thing for you to do. I think that's where our future is leading and we're so lucky to already be part of the way there as birders, I think. So thank you, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that maybe a little weird kind of talk about birding. Um, and uh, if there's, I guess, any questions also, yeah, if you go to albrosadventures.com, um, very soon I'm gonna be putting together some workshops and also a membership site, learning about birds and so forth. So I'll, we can, um, yeah, if you wanna do that, that would be great. Let me stop sharing here and I can, Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. That was great. I think Thanks. I think um, it's just it's just really nice to be reminded that uh, there's so many dimensions to birding, and that it, there's room for everybody. And there's also uh, many of us uh, get into leading field trips and whatnot. And it's good to remember um, that it's not just counting birds; it's also helping people appreciate birding not just to identify the birds so yeah yeah, yeah. And that's what your talk uh, certainly says a lot about and i really appreciate that 
reminder to to sort of all of us really whatever stage of birding you're in that it's it's just and perfect to have. I love rare birds and I love you know the discovery and I love all those things but I also sometimes I just all I need is a savannah sparrow the field and boom I'm happy yeah yeah <laughs> so is, so questions for well, yeah, are. if you have any questions, if you don't have questions, that's fine too. But and you, you don't have to put them in chat. You can ask them out loud here. Yeah, yeah. There's there's not so many of us that we can't do that. I oh. see Steve has a question. Yeah, I just wanted to. It's not really a question, Alvaro, but right here in Rochester, uh, we have um, you can get certified. A doc can get certified in lifestyle management. Um, and uh, actually the guy that does it here, Ted Barnett, is an avid birder. And oh, wow. the birders, I mean, the, the docs can actually prescribe you to, okay, you have to spend two hours, uh, you know, every weekend or an hour a day uh, somewhere outside in nature. So prescribing nature is, is wow. actually becoming a, becoming a thing. It's already happening. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's good. I I did not know about this this in Rochester. That's great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. You can you can uh, look him up. It's an in interesting guy. I think there's another question. A yeah. couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Elviro, Elviro, I, I want to thank you for um, allowing me to excuse myself all the misidentification that I've done on birding trips. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, there's a lot of people that have said to me the same kind of things, like, thank you for just allowing me to be wrong. Like, why not? I mean, in fact, we should encourage it. And I, I felt that, you know, I, I, I get this, the sweat that happens, you know, when I realize I pointed something out and isn't really what it is, but then that's when the learning also goes on. And I like learning, so I should like being wrong. <laughs> as a, as a follow-on, I'm wondering: Have you ever read the book *Blink* by Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, because that's very similar to what yeah. um, the Economist is talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's a good. I like Gladwell. Uh, his books. Anyway, I don't know the guy. <laughs> uh, Steve put. Um... Uh, the Rochester Lifestyle Medicine, Ted, Ted Barnett's uh, name in the chat, if anybody would like to copy it down. Oh, there's a hand. Yeah, yeah. Angie. Um, more of a comment, really, than a question, but very much related to everything that you're saying. Um, I work on a college campus, and I'm also taking classes part-time. And um, I always laugh because, you know, all of the students and even a lot of the staff and faculty, you know, around lunchtime or whatever, they're walking around campus and their faces are in their camera or in their phones, or, you know, they're listening to music or they're just, you know, walking and looking forward and doing whatever. Um, and then meanwhile, you have me who's walking around, <laughs> staring up at the sky. I'll like wander up to a tree because I can hear something. And I'm like, I don't think that's a house finch but what is that so you know I'm late to class which my my instructor knows that I'm a birder so <laughs> she she kind of gives me a little bit of leeway sometimes when I'm late and she's like okay what'd you see I was like well actually I saw a blah 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 so um it's it's just it's one of those things that I've noticed at least for myself is that I've become very much more aware of my surroundings um, a, because of the photography, which is what got me into birding, was actually just general nature photography um, and the birding, you know, and, and being more in tune. I'm, I'm listening and I'm watching and I'm, you know, I see movement in a tree. Um, and I do that all the time, not just, okay, I'm going out and I'm meeting with the other RBA folks and I'm going to go on a birding trip. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm always looking for birds. And even when I'm not actively looking, I'm always seeing them. So. Yeah, I, awesome. I've had people people who, who are not birders and say, okay, when when you actually go and do your birding, and I said, I always say, I'm birding right now. 
they they don't understand they have to explain you know i'm always paying attention to that little connection to nature that's going on out i mean even you can watch tv and you hear a bird being piped in and you pay attention you somehow notice and it's uh it's you know i will sometimes look at the trees in a show and say oh that looks different that's not they say it's minnesota it doesn't look like minnesota from the trees and it's not that i want to be right or wrong uh i i'm enjoying the show but i think you just start paying attention to these things that you are just part of your life <laughs> yeah good yeah good thing that you're that she, that they're okay with you being late <laughs> Yeah, nice. Anybody else have a question or comment? I just wanted to say that when my husband found out you were talking, he was over the moon. You are his hero. <laughs> he first page in Birdwatcher's Digest. And many years ago, we were at the Space Coast Festival and you led a trip and he was just amazed. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, uh, that's, that's super nice. I mean, uh, gosh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Well, we can all uh, maybe hope to get on a plane sometime and um, and uh, head out to California to go on a tour with <laughs> Alvaro. <laughs> that would be would be nice. You go to Spain also, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And Bhutan is that? Did I remember hearing you go to Bhutan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're waiting for Bhutan to open up to travel again. They they've been very good at keeping COVID down and so forth. So, but so they're very careful about reopening. But it's a beautiful place. Very, it's an amazing country in so many ways. And lots of lots of nature. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking actually while you were mentioning. Uh, you know, focusing on one little location. I think COVID has helped us do that. At least uh, I, my husband and I, uh, we, we've we sort of focused in on one little area that's close to home, be, mainly because of COVID. Where uh, So it, it has gotten us a little more focused on home than we uh, sometimes had been in the past. So that's, that's been great. And I think it's, I think COVID has also gotten a lot more people out to, uh, out into nature and 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 maybe noticing birds more yeah. um, than in the past. So that's great. So any other questions? Uh, breed, um, Anne McMicken, participating in the Breeding Bird Atlas has been an absolute gift as well. Yeah. So New York State is in the process of doing a Breeding Bird Atlas. So it has gotten a lot of us out and to do more slow birding because yeah to observe the birds, yeah, a little more closely than we have it, in the past. So that's, it's a, yeah. It's a yeah, great concept to just like, you're in a sense, you're being focused, right? It's yeah. Like, okay, for these months, you listen to the birds, where are they nesting? And it's great. Yeah, yeah. that thing's yeah. great. Yeah, and just to observe what they're doing, you know, what, to pay closer attention. For example, we were uh, just uh, at a trail and there's a, a downy woodpecker, male downy woodpecker who's, who's for the last two days of excavating a hole, uh, you know, a, a nest hole. Uh, here it is in the fall. Maybe he's, uh, I don't know why he's doing this in the fall. Maybe, uh, maybe they, maybe this is what they normally do, but he's been working on it for two days, uh, three days. Um, that is, that is getting ready for winter activity. And unfortunately I have one that's been trying to build a hole in my house. Um, and it's taken constant effort to uh, discourage it to, uh, you know, encourage it to go find a tree yeah. instead. <laughs> so he's going to nest in there in the winter. Is that what you're saying, Amy? Yeah. The one that, you, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to share my house with the town at yeah, this right, point. Right. But yes, um, they, they will typically, especially the young that, you know, they've matured, they're going to stay in the area. They're looking for a new home. They've been ah, kicked out yeah. of the family nest tree and they're finding their own oh, yeah thank you great anybody else liz did you have anything else you'd like to mention? Oh, that that's about it i'd like to thank you guys all for logging in tonight we'll be back next month on november 11th to feature jared clark who will be talking about 
birds of Newfoundland and Labrador perched on the edge of North America. So we look forward to that about a month from now. And until then, I hope you guys all have a great fall and we will hopefully see you out on the trail somewhere. Or if, if not, we'll see you via Zoom next month. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to um, remind people there's a great opportunity to uh, get to know nature on December 19th, which is our annual Christmas bird count. The details are in this month's, um, in November's Little Gulp. Thanks, Norma. Yep, that's great. It's a fun, great. fun thing to do. Um, and Liz, I didn't have a chance to uh, ask, or I have a comment or a, just an alert from the conservation committee, if I could just briefly, who's here. Um, if there's a, a state um, agency called ORES, O-R-E-S, and if you Google that, it should come up. Um, if you go to their page and look at permits that are coming in, this is the new, agency that was just developed for green energy siting and they have taken away um, unfortunately any home rule chances uh, there's very little um, public participation involved but you can see how many um, projects are coming up and there are currently three projects in our birding area that you might want to make yourself um, more aware of. One we've been following for five years, the Heritage Project, um, and there's a hearing coming up which is unfortunately closed to the public, um, but they're going to be making some big decisions um, on the 27th. But there are also two solar projects now in that same area. One is in the town of Barry and Shelby, and the other one is in the town of Oak. Um, um, it's immediately west of there, sorry, I'm pulling a blank on names, but also Orleans County, just north of um, the Wildlife Refuge. These are very, very large projects. Um, so you might wanna take a look and get some more information about them um, and what the impacts are possibly gonna be for our, one of our favorite birding areas. Um, there's other projects in our, our area as well. That's, uh, it would be really great if people would, take a peek there once in a while and see what's happening. Um, and um, it's not too late to talk to some of your local politicians about trying to balance our need for green energy with our need for biodiversity and keeping biodiversity. Um, they can both be achieved at the same time. Um, but unfortunately in New York state, they're kind of not looking at things that subtly. So um, we have to just kind of ask questions and um, hope for the best. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Yep, you got it. All okay. right. I think that- Thanks again, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank Hello. you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank Bye -bye. you again. And I thought it was a great talk and it was great meeting you. <laughs> thank you. Have Bye -bye. a great night, everybody. Thanks. See you next month.